As the carriage slowly meandered through the forest, Jesper filled Klaus in on the news from the town. The baker has a sale on cakes. Oh, and did you know that arson is down 70%? It's true. When was the last time you saw a house burn down? Precisely. Cookouts, swap meets, and uh, I don't know. It's like everyone has gone mad or something. Silence fell as Jesper sat, wondering what had happened to the townspeople. A true selfless act always sparks another. Well, look who's turned suddenly into a chatterbox. Tell me, what made you squander all those words into that nugget of wisdom? It's just something someone used to say. Klaus's voice trailed off into the night. Jesper, oblivious to his friend's furrowed brow, carried on. Well, let me tell you something. I've been around long enough to know that everyone is out to get something. Those kids, those kids are in it for the toys. And the grown-ups, well, I don't know what they're after. But it's sure not goodwill and peace on earth. Jesper lays back into his seat and lowered his hat over his eyes. Klaus glanced over. What about you? What's in it for you? Jesper squirmed. Me? Oh, you know, well... He sighed. It's just different. How many have seen that movie? A handful? If you haven't, you have to go on to Netflix. The name of the movie is Klaus. And it is my favorite uh, Christmas movie ever. It came out last year. We watched it uh, last year. And it, it is very, very impactful, uh, amazing movie. I think you'd enjoy it on Netflix called Klaus. And how cool is that, that that's our team that, that animated and voiced over and all the rest of that entire thing. Isn't that crazy? So good. Come on, give them a hand. Well, welcome everyone to My Victory Church. Welcome to Okotoks with Pastor Joel and Tanisha. Welcome to you guys. Give them a hand. Welcome to everyone that's joining us in Clara's home with Pastor Brian and Heidi. Welcome to you guys. Welcome everyone that's joining us in Lloyd Minster with uh, Pastor Mike and Carol. Welcome to you guys. Welcome Tabor and everyone that's joining us online. Welcome to all of you guys. Welcome Lethbridge with Pastor Ralph and Cindy. Welcome to you as well. Three people are excited to be here. It is a great day. We're, we're, this, is, this is a series we've called Holly Jolly Christmas. And the reason why we wanted to do this series is, well, I'll just have to admit, it's probably for selfish reasons for me. I don't know if you're like me. I'm, I'm sure I've talked with many of you and, and you felt the same way. But if you're like me, uh, this year has been, well, it's been a year. And it's been one of those, it's been one of those years where it's, it's more difficult than maybe ever in my lifetime to kind of, to kind of pick myself up and, and to, and to fight for joy and to, and to keep from discouragement. Anybody been battling discouragement like never before? Anybody else? It's just, it's a crazy, it's a crazy year that way. So we felt in this series, we felt it was so vital for us to get our joy back, to fight for our joy and understand what that is. And the reason why we felt so appropriate to talk about joy at Christmas time, well, because the announcement of Jesus, the angels, when they announced it to the shepherds, Jesus' birth, this is what they said. The angels said to them, the shepherds, don't be afraid. I will bring you good news that will cause great joy for some of the people. No, it says for all the people. What an incredible promise that the announcement of the birth of Jesus our Savior was not going to be was not going to be joy for some or just for those who believe but it was going to be the cause of of joy for all and and it's it's one of those one of those things where you think about it and going, yeah, okay, well, Christmas is interesting at Christmas we seem to have a little bit more of a bounce on our stuff we have a little bit more joy um, I don't know for in, in my lifetime I've never experienced a Christmas like this and and I, I don't know, you know, the announcements this, this week from our, our government and the whole realization that Christmas is going to be very different this year. Man, that, that, that hit me hard. Anybody else? The, the realization that family is not, it's, we're not going to be able to gather like we have in the past, that some of the, the traditions that we've had over Christmas time is, is not going to be the same. And, and you look at that and going, oh man, it, it, 
can suck the joy right out of you and, it's, and discourage you and weigh you down. And we need to learn how to fight for our joy and get it back. Now, uh, about a month ago, I read uh, an incredible uh, book. The book's name is Resilience by uh, Eric uh, Greitens. And I highly recommend uh, this book. It's a book written by a Navy SEAL. Greitens was a, a Navy SEAL as written to one of his uh, one of his partners that he had done a number of tours with, uh, another SEAL who had just came back from a tour and was battling with with addictions and discouragement and and he was suicidal and so Eric began writing a series of letters to him in order to pick pick him up and these letters are absolutely phenomenal and one of those letters he addresses happiness and he gave a definition of happiness that I found fascinating this is what he said he said happiness in, in much the same way that we have three primary colors Anybody else go to Boston Pizza and they give your kids three crayons and the kids look at you like, where's the rest? And they complain. Nobody else has had that problem. Just my kids complain about that. But, but it's amazing because just like there's three primary colors, and out of, just think about this, out of three primary colors, there's an infinite number of potential color combinations, potential colors that can come out of, out of just three primary sources. And in the same way, Greitens said this, that just like there's three primary colors and an infinite number of colors that can come from that, happiness has three primary sources that an infinite number of, of, of happenings and happiness that can happen in our life can happen. Now, when he, when he said this, at first, I got to be honest, I didn't believe him. But I, I'm going to explain to you as I go through what these three are again quickly in case we've forgotten. But number one, he says, is the happiness, happiness, and I'm starting to sound Viking now. Anyway, um, is the happiness of pleasure. The happiness of pleasure is easy to understand. It's easy to experience. We find it in a good plate of, of food or a great bowl of ice cream. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's in a crackling fire, or some of you have been talking already and counting down the days when we can get back to camping, hopefully together. It can, it can be a good night's sleep in a really comfy bed. It's just, it's the happiness of pleasure. There's multiple shades, just like there's multiple shades of red. There's multiple shades of, of pleasure and happiness. The second source of, of happiness is the happiness of excellence. Now, he defines excellence. This goes hand in hand with hard work, with pursuing worthy goals, and with growing in mastery. That it's not just hard work. It's not just achievement. It's growing in mastery. And, and he, he likened it, said, he says, you know, we can, we can view happiness as a mountain climber at the summit and reaching the peak and their, the, the elation on their, you know, faces. They take their selfie because they've crushed it. But he says the pure mountain climbers have as, just as much joy in the ascent and in the climb as they do in actually achieving and reaching the top. That's the happiness of excellence. And it's multiple shades of, of excellence as well. Then he called the last one the happiness of grace, which I found fascinating. Because as far as I know, this book is not a, a Christian book. And I don't know if Eric Greitens is a Christian or not. He never got a sense of that. He certainly has an understanding of God. But I'm not sure that he's a believer or not. I, I don't know. But he says the happiness of grace. And grace is defined as a free gift from God that comes to us even though we haven't earned it. It's God's unmerited favor. And there's happiness that comes. There's happiness that comes in, in you know, grace and, and God just giving us something undeserved. And this, this grace is experienced when, when you see a sunset or, or a sunrise or when you see, when you, when you see the mountains at, at nighttime, the full moon shining on them, or when you're standing on a beach. Remember those days um, with palm trees? <laughs> um, those, those fun times where you stood there and just something hits you and you're like, thank you. And, and Greitens says this. He says, how do you know what this, who you're thanking? What's going? He says, there's, there's, there's God's unmerited favor, undeserved favor. It's the happiness of grace. Now, as he mentioned these three, and I began to kind of pull this apart and saying, I'm not sure if I believe this or not. Something hit me, and this is the reason why I had to put this into this series. is because this is what I realized in, in me this year. I realized that in March, when everything was shut down the first time, I realized that I, I battled with more discouragement and we adjusted as a church and we, we went online right away and I'm so proud of our team and how we adjusted and we did an online service and we started a couple websites and we had, we had you know, kids' website going on and our, you know, we adjusted our website to go online and our team did amazing. 
But I found, as, as the longer we were shut down, I found that this happiness of, of excellence, my happiness of excellence began to diminish greatly. And, and this is what I found. I found that every, this is just Pastor Kelly's confession time now, I found myself extremely miserable, on, especially on Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons. Because it's hard enough to preach to a camera and rather than to, to, to people because cameras don't give you any feedback and you don't know whether, whether it's registering. That's, that's hard enough. But then having to watch yourself, ugh, nasty. And then I'd sit there and I was like, and then I'd watch the service and I was like, man, worship is great. And then it comes to the sermon, I was just like, ah. Uh, and I'd find myself picking myself apart and, and oh, I could have said that better, I should have done this and uh, uh, all the rest of it. And I, I found myself hollow after a Sunday service watching online. And I realized that there's a whole lot more to church than what happens on the stage. That really the thing that I was like, there's a whole lot more to church than just the music that we produce up here. This, there's, something, there's something special about us gathering together. And the Bible talks about don't forsake the gathering together. That I realized that I got as much fulfillment from, from smiling and shaking hands and hugging necks and all the rest. Remember when we could do that? We're getting, one day. I'm not a hugger, but man, when this thing is over, you all watch out. I'm going to cling. Like, we're going we're gonna, to, it's just going to be, I just want to hug. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's one of those, it's one of those things. But I didn't realize how much fulfillment I got from interaction and from people and all the rest of it. And I found myself on the weekends being miserable. And I didn't know what to do. So here's what happens. One of the sources, the happiness of excellence, began to, began to, get diminished and, and 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 I found myself getting frustrated and when you when you start losing in one area the tendency is you want to overcompensate in the other so I found I found myself you know I got to occupy myself I got to do something else I got you know I got to find you know find something I enjoy you know pleasure I got to find something you know I got to get more in, in, in Bible study or something this happiness of grace and pressing to God and all the rest of it. no matter how hard I tried to do it I couldn't find the answer or the 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 relief from the problem that I was feeling the discouragement that I was feeling because I couldn't replace this and it wasn't until my dad sent um, a, a, a music track to me that he just, he, my dad's a songwriter and he hasn't written for, for years and years. Actually, he and I did a couple albums together. I produced it. He, he sung, you know, he writes songs and I put the music all together for him and, and all this. And, and he, we did it a couple albums before my mom died. And when my mom died, my dad stopped writing. And then all of a sudden in COVID, he's like sending me a song, just him and an acoustic guitar and saying, Hey, what do you think? And then he sent me another one. Hey, what do you think? And all of a sudden I thought, okay. I took the, the weekends, which was my battle time, and I, I started taking on project, his project and began producing you know, some of his music and working that. And I'd come into the church and some equipment here and different things, and I, I would just begin taking on a project. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, the discouragement stopped going away because the happiness of excellence and the happiness of achievement and the happiness of hard work started to come up. And when I read this in the book, I was like, oh my. When we're lacking joy and when we're lacking happiness, we need to identify which one of these three sources is lacking the most and then begin to replace in that area, not double. You can't double up. See, a lot of people try to double up on pleasure. And you, just like you can't get more red if you double up on blue, you can't get more happiness. You can't get the happiness of excellence if you double up on pleasure. Does that make sense? That these three, these three are, are really, really key. Now, today I want to focus on, in the time we have left, I want to focus on the happiness of, of grace. Because the happiness of excellence and hard work and achievement, all the rest of it, that's explanatory. The happiness of pleasure, we focused on that last week with, with Leland. How, how, how many of you enjoy just laughing? Just being able just to laugh. And, and that, you know, I, and some, you know, came in like, oh, well, that's not very spiritual, having a comedian come in here and just, just laughing all the rest of it. But I, I think you probably walked out a little bit lighter and you're feeling a little bit better and probably feeling a little bit more connected to God because all of a sudden you take, you take some of the heaviness and you let it go and all of a sudden you just have just a, a better week because you, you do that. And we just tapped into to maybe something that we've been lacking this year. And that's just a little bit getting our laugh back, getting our joy back. 
But the happiness of grace, and, and like I said before, grace is simply defined in, in the Bible, biblical definition, is God's unmerited favor or undeserved favor. So grace is receiving a free gift that results in a big sense of gratitude. If, you, if, you want, if you're a note taker and you want to you know, decide, okay, define it, grace is receiving a free gift that results in a big sense of gratitude. Something that you couldn't earn necessarily on your own because that, that would be excellent. But just something undeserved, something unexpected, something that you just like, that creates a big sense of gratitude. But grace, and this is what we're going to look at, it, grace is also about giving an undeserved free gift. There's two sides of this, another shade to this that's interesting. There's a joy that comes from receiving, but there's also a joy that comes from giving. Look at this, these verses in Acts chapter 20. Paul, who, who was you know, a very religious Pharisee, he was actually one of, he's actually being promoted, and, and some historians say that he might have been on track for becoming the next high priest or definitely going to be one of the top uh, Pharisees, you know, and he was rising quickly. And then until God interrupted and Jesus showed up and Paul was actually on his way to persecute other Christians. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And that's Acts chapter 9. And, and Paul had this radical conversion. And, and Paul goes from that radical conversion to going from, from killing Christians and persecuting Christians and imprisoning Christians to actually becoming one of, you know, the most active and traveling and, 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 and biggest, you know, Christians. He, he, he's, in fact, he's responsible for writing two-thirds of the New Testament. That Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus, and this is what he said in verse 32. He says, and so now I entrust you into God's hands and the message of his grace, which is all that you need to become strong. Ooh, there's so much just in that sentence. I entrust you. This is what he's saying. This is Pastor Paul now saying to the church in Ephesus, I'm entrusting you now into God's hands and the message of his grace. Grace, which is all that you need to become strong. Then he says this, all of God's blessings are imparted through the message of his grace. Man, I could preach on just this verse forever and ever. All, not, not some, all of God's blessings are imparted through the message of his grace. Not the message of the law, not the message of his rules, not the message of, uh, but the message of his undeserved, unmerited Favor, which he provides as the spiritual inheritance, meaning it's not something we can earn, deserve. It's something that it's, it's an inheritance given to all of his holy ones, those who believe in Jesus. Now, it's interesting to me that Paul mentions twice in this one verse the message of God's grace. See, this is so important to Paul. The message of God's grace is so important to Paul because he came out of graceless religion. He came out of the pharisaical law where everything was about the rules and about, you know, earning God's acceptance and earning, uh, you, know, the, you know, the church's acceptance. And he came out of that and what he discovered was a relationship with God. He discovered God's unmerited, undeserved favor as a free gift. And he was so overwhelmed by this that twice in this sentence he's writing to this church and says, man, I'm entrusting you and all you need to become strong is Grace, God's unmerited favor. All of God's blessings are in the message of his grace. So Paul is so grateful, so thankful that he has to emphasize over and over and over again that's this grace. There's nothing that Paul's saying, there's nothing I could do to earn God's acceptance. He freely gave it to me. There's nothing I could do to earn a relationship with him. He freely, freely gave it to me as an inheritance. There's nothing I did. It's all him. There's freedom there. And the only way he could describe this freedom, this happiness, this joy, was by using the word grace, undeserved favor. Then he goes on, he says this, I haven't been after your money or any of your possessions. That's, we could preach on that verse. Hey, Pastor Ralph, we could preach on that one forever. Because a lot of people are thinking, you know, the church is just after your money. Paul's like, I'm not after your money. Religion might be, but we're not after your money. 
Paul's saying, I'm not after your money or your possessions. Then he says this, you all know that I've worked with my hands to meet my own needs and the needs of those who serve me. So Paul recognized that this undeserved favor didn't come from the church to him. It came from God. The favor that he's experiencing, the blessing that he's experiencing, is not because he's put the pressure on the church to give it to him. It came from God. And then he talks about hard work, which is the happiness of excellence. But the hard work wasn't just about him. Because look what he says next. Verse 35, he says, I have left you an example of how you should serve and take care of those who are weak. For we must always cherish the words of our Lord Jesus who taught this, giving brings a far greater blessing than receiving. For those of you who are familiar with the King James Bible, this is the verse that says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Giving brings a far greater blessing than receiving. So this is, this is how Paul describes it. This is, there's so much in these, in these few verses. Paul explains that grace, okay, God's undeserved favor, is not just to be received. It's to be given as well. And he says it is more blessed to give that grace than it is to receive that grace. Right after he says he's, he's been extra grateful, extra demonstrative of, of, of grace and saying it. God's grace that's going to make you strong. It's God's grace that that is going to cause all his blessings to come on you. But he says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And he was feeling pretty blessed in what he had received. So imagine the joy that he felt in in sharing that as well. It's interesting because this verse, you know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So I looked up the word, you know, blessed. What What does the word blessed mean? Well, the word blessed means, look at this, happy fortunate to be envied. Happy, fortunate to be envied. What's the first word? Happy. (laughs) Happy. It's the happiness of grace. So he says, I'm receiving this and it's created happiness, but in return, I give it as well. That also creates blessing or happiness, fortunate to be envied. The Aramaic word that Paul used here is an idiom that speaks of extravagant generosity. In other words, blessed are those who try to give more than they have been given. Think about it. Blessed are those who try to give more than they've been given. Wow. So you already know this truth. That's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? I mean, if you're like me, you get more excited, you know, not when you're a little kid, maybe, but, but as you get a little bit older, you become more excited about the gifts you're giving than the ones that you're going to receive. Anybody else? It's like, I'm super excited about it. You just, you find that perfect gift. You're like, oh, look at this. So Paul says, you receive undeserved favor. He says the happiness bless, is more blessed. You'll get more happiness. If you actually give grace. Now, it's not just Jesus who said this or Paul who said this. There's actually been recent studies that have, you know, scientific studies that have proven this as well. So here's, here's a quote from an article I read, How Generosity Increases Happiness, and the article's by Alta Sciences. This is what they said. Studies have shown that happier people are more generous. So it becomes a cycle of giving and joy. In addition to feeling happier, advantages of being generous include better health, reduced stress, and a stronger sense of purpose. Some studies even showed that being generous helps fight depression and can help us live longer. This isn't Bible. This is is science. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? So one recent study, look, listen, listen, one recent study by SQ uh, Park said this. They used a functional MRI and they p- compared the brains of individuals who were planning to spend money on someone else. This was an experimental group versus the brains of, of people planning to spend money on themselves. 
And they found that making generous choices actually activated the TPJ or the temporal parietal um, junction area of the brain, the part of the system that regulates rewards in social situations that actually the MRI started to picking up. Your brain functions different when you're beginning to be generous. In, in brief, this is how they summarize their findings. In brief, giving to others made people happier than receiving for themselves. Isn't that amazing? This is what Paul said. If, still, if, you, if you still don't believe that generosity creates more happiness and giving unmerited gifts and unmerited favor, Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Isn't that good? We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And I, I started meditating on, that, on that, that quote, and I was like, is that true? But let me, let me just kind of, let me kind of prove it to you. Anybody heard of St. Nicholas? Of course you have. Good old St. Nick. I mean... St. Nicholas, I mean, isn't this what Christmas is all about? Listen, listen, you might know St. Nicholas as Santa Claus and all the, all the things that go around, you know, Santa Claus. But let, let, me, just, let me just give you a little bit of history of, of who St. Nicholas actually was. St. Nicholas was lived in, in around three, you know, 300 to 326 um, uh, A.D. And, and here's some of the historical facts. He was born to wealthy parents who raised him to, to be a, a devout Christian. And his parents died in, ep in an epidemic while Nicholas was still young. So what did he do? Instead of feeling sorry for, for himself, he obeyed Jesus' words, which in the New Testament, Jesus said this, sell what you own. And it's interesting because Nicholas took these words and Jesus was saying this to a rich young ruler. So Nicholas inherits you know, this wealth from his parents and he's reading the New Testament one day and he comes across Jesus telling a rich young ruler and he's young and all he says, sell what you have and give the money to the poor. So you know what young Nicholas does? He uses his entire, not some of it, his entire inheritance to assist the needy, the sick and the suffering. And he dedicated his life to serving God and was made Bishop of, of Mira while still a young man. And Bishop Nicholas became known throughout the land for his generosity to those in need. And he was one of the youngest men to ever be named Bishop. In fact, those of you who are biblical scholars and all the, all the rest of it, he was part of the Council of Nicaea. But Nicholas, listen, this is, this is fascinating about his history. Nicholas was, was um, raised in in kind of Roman-occupied uh, territory in Italy and Spain, all the rest of in that kind of, he was kind of worked and ministered in, in that area under Emperor Diocletian. Diocletian was one of the harshest uh, emperors ever to Christians and persecuting. And so he spent much of his life in prison or being persecuted and all the rest of that. And, and, uh, but yet still, instead of feeling sorry for himself, instead of using his wealth to, for his own protection, he used it to help others. In fact, one of the most famous stories is that uh, a father, a really poor father who had three young daughters and uh, you know, didn't have a dowry for his daughters. And in those days, um, you know, if you didn't have a dowry, your daughters would end up, you couldn't get married, they'd end up as slaves. And so, and if you had a small dowry, you didn't get, get a very good guy. And it, so having a big dowry was going to guarantee that you'd be, you know, have the right guy there, and you'd be set up for life. And so this poor father had no dowry for his daughters, and he had three daughters. And yet, miraculously, somehow, um, just about the time his daughter came of age to be married, a bag of gold would appear inside their house. And it was said that, that you know, they, they attribute it to Nicholas, that he would throw a bag of gold into an open window and, and three times, there was three bags of gold for each of the three daughters, and, and the time came that he threw the bag of gold. And now when he threw the bag of gold into the uh, open window, guess where one of them landed? It landed in some stockings that were hanging by a fire, drying. And when this story got around, this became the tradition, 300 AD, this became the tradition to where we still have stockings hung by the fire because children would want this kind of wealth, that kind of gift to come to them. And so they would hope that, man, if I hang my stocking, maybe there'll be gold in it. Now listen, 
That's 1,700 years ago. And here we are 1,700 years later talking about a man named Nicholas. And the reason why we're talking about him and the reason why we talk about him every year at this year is because he made a life out of being generous. Isn't that remarkable? Which leads us to our takeaway. That a true selfless act sparks another. It's a quote in the movie, Klaus, but it's, it's so true. A true selfless act sparks another. Nicholas's three, 1,700 years ago, selfless act to give away wealth has now sparked the fact that each Christmas you and I become generous more than any other time of the year. Typically, we become generous to one another. A true selfless act sparks another. But you know what's also amazing? Is that Nicholas... His act of generosity was sparked because of the generosity of his Savior and the generosity that he had seen in God and modeled through Jesus. That because he saw how Jesus gave him unmerited favor, unmerited grace, grace undeserved, he dedicated his life to being generous as well. He made a life and a legacy because of his generosity. While what he did was impressive and worth celebrating, what Jesus gave is worth worshiping. Nicholas gave because God gave grace to him. It's a true selfless act. Sparks another. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your undeserved favor, for your generosity exponentially to us. That you give us favor, you give us peace undeserved, you give us joy undeserved, you give us strength undeserved, you give us faith undeserved. God, you give us relationship with you undeserved, freely. Thank you. I pray that we would use that gift and be generous with others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, maybe your thought has been that you have to be good enough in order to be accepted by God. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus paid for all of your mistakes, all of your sins, and he gave you undeserved favor, meaning that you don't need to be good enough to get his acceptance You don't need to change in order to get his acceptance. You're accepted just as you are. It's undeserved favor. And all you need to do to begin relationship with him is confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now that does just that. We're going to confess with our mouth that Jesus is God. If you're praying this for the first time, pray with all your heart. Believe what you're praying is true and right here, right now you can begin relationship with him. Let's pray this together. Everyone repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God and I believe that you rose again from the dead and I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord and Savior and my friend. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins, for accepting me just as I am, I give my heart to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask everyone to keep their eyes closed and heads bowed. If you pray this prayer the first time, everyone else's eyes are closed and heads bowed. You just boldly raise up your hand and give me a wave and saying, yeah, Pastor, I prayed this prayer the first time. I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. At the end of the service, we'd love to give you a Bible that explains what this relationship is all about. I'll look around one more time. Make sure I didn't miss anyone. Just give me a quick wave. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Man, isn't God good? Amen. Amen.